presentation and discussion session. We present three external labeling concepts that allow a user to browse through point sets without the need of zooming in and out. In the first method, labels are distributed on multiple pages. The next method arranges the labels in a single row that can be continuously slid along the bottom side of the map. In our third method, labels are distributed on stacks, which a user can independently browse through. Although prior work has examined how visualization impacts decision making, there is no concrete method for quantifying and comparing the impact of different encodings on decisions. We rethink how we evaluate decision making with visualizations by leveraging work from economic theory. We present the results of a large scale lottery game that evaluates the impact of five different visualization designs on risk behavior and decision making. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. In our work, we look at how narratives and gamification can be used to foster development of visualization literacy skills in young children between 11 to 13. We present our own instance of such a game, evaluate it in a between-subject study, and report results. We also detail key design considerations for future visualization-based games and highlight many opportunities for future work. Researchers use Argus to determine the sample size based on estimations. There exists a non-trivial dynamic relationship between those estimations and the statistical result and power. Argus allows researchers to explore scenarios of experiment design and effect sizes to better plan experiments. All right, then welcome to this full paper session on uncertainty. My name is Lars Svensson. I'm from the University of Münster in Germany, as you see behind me. And I have the pleasure to chair this session. And we have six great talks here. So the fully packed session here. Uh, so we should get started immediately. If you have questions, please post them on YouTube or on Discord. So I'm looking forward to your questions. And we directly start with the first talk, which would be a local one if we were actually in Utah right now. It's from Tusha Appaway from the University of Utah. And he will be talking to us about direct volume rendering 
with non-parametric models of uncertainty. And this is joint work with Boma, Elam Saki, Chris Johnson, and Teresa, uh, Ali Reza and her Indizari. Please. Hello, everyone. I'm Tushar Athavle, and in this talk, I will present our work on direct volume rendering for non-parametric models of data uncertainty. Here is the outline of my presentation. Initially, I will briefly describe the importance of considering data uncertainty into volume visualization framework by discussing a few important related research and also the state-of-the-art parametric models of volume visualizations. Next, I will discuss our technical contributions on extension of volume visualization to non-parametric models and 2D transfer functions. And finally, I will present a few results demonstrating the comparisons of visualizations obtained using various statistical frameworks such as mean, parametric, and our proposed non-parametric. The topic of uncertainty visualization has been recognized as one of the top research challenges because it can potentially improve the decision-making process. As we can see, the errors or uncertainties can get propagated in each stage of the visualization pipeline. For example, the randomness in data acquisition is often a result of sampling and quantization errors or data reduction in the case of large-scale data. In the mapping phase, errors may get propagated as we map data to visual attributes, to, to visual attributes or geometric attributes. Hence, understanding the uncertainty in visualizations is important in avoiding misinterpretations regarding underlying data. Several recent studies analyzed the uncertainty propagation in the volume rendering pipeline. In 2002, a method was proposed to interactively explore volumetric datasets by encoding uncertainty into opacity dimension of the transfer function. Later, statistical quantifications were advocated over transfer functions for volume segmentation in order to avoid tediousness involved in the transfer function design process. A, a study of possible set of volume renderings was performed by varying uncertain parameters of each stage of visualization pipeline by Fout and Ma. Recently, the effects of discretization errors such as finite grid resolution and the finite viewing ray sampling density were studied on the volume rendered images. In, now I will briefly describe the state of the art parametric model which takes input as ensemble or a high resolution data set. The first step is to reduce the data because the input data is usually a large scale data set. Here we show the comparison of the mean and para mean statistics in the top row with the param and parametric statist statistics in the bottom row. In the mean statistics, we store a single value representing mean of uncertain data per grid vertex, whereas in the parametric st statistics, we store a probability distribution per vertex. Hence, the reconstructed sample uh, in the mean statistics is a single value, whereas it is a in the case of probability parametric statistics it is a probability distribution in the transfer function classification case hence we have a single lookup in the transfer function for mean statistics whereas we have to integrate the probability distribution against transfer function in parametric approach thus it was shown that the parametric framework improves the classification accuracy when compared to the mean statistics motivated by this framework we study non-parametric models of uncertainty the non-parametric models were advocated over the, parametric, over the mean and parametric statistical models in the context of visualization for their improved accuracy. However, the improved accuracy comes at the cost of increased storage and computational requirements. As can be seen, the mean requires one value per voxel, uh, which is a mean value. In the parametric statistics, we store two values, which is mean and width of the distribution, whereas in the non-parametric case, we have several multiple representative samples per voxel also in the case of parametric parametric statistics the number of convolution operations involved in interpolation of random variables is constant which is one uh, whereas the, in case of non parametric case the number of convolutions grow exponentially with the number of bins used in the histogram Recently, Liu and Liu et al. proposed a Monte Carlo sampling method to accommodate the exponential complexity of Gaussian mixture models. Uh, 
However, their approach involved, um, however, Monte Carlo sampling is an expensive strategy and also they proposed image space compositing to produce the final visualizations which is a non-interactive fashion of producing volume visualizations. To overcome the, we overcome the disadvantages of the Gaussian mixture models by proposing the use of quantile interpolation for non-parametric distributions. We basically, the quantile interpolation is a closed form linear time complexity framework and hence does not require Monte Carlo sampling and also the volume rendering can be done in an interactive fashion. In this, the basic idea of quantile interpolation is to break the probability distribution at each grid vertex in, fixed num in a fixed number of quantiles using a user set quantile value which is 0.5 in this case and, and then interpolating the respective quantiles. As we can see, because of the quantile wise operations, the complexity of the framework is linearly proportional to the number of quantiles. Now recently, Hollister and Pang um, used uh, or extended this quantile interpolation idea to 2D fields for visualization of uncertain vector fields. We extend the quantile interpolation to 3D case in order to accommodate it in the reconstruction stage of the direct volume rendering pipeline. The same shapes of Monte Carlo and analytical distributions confirm the correctness of our derivation of quantile interpolation in 3D. Thus, we summarize our non-parametric statistical framework in this uh, in this slide. Uh, as we can see, at each grid vertex, we represent probability distribution using the quantiles. Then we reconstruct the distribution at a viewing ray sample using quantile interpolation. And finally, we integrate the uh, interpolated distribution against the transfer function. We also extend the idea of statistical rendering to 2D transfer functions. The idea uh, where the second dimension is a gradient magnitude. The 2D transfer functions were uh, proposed by Nice et al. in 2001 and they showed that the classification of material boundaries can be uh, enhanced uh, or, ca or can be effectively explored using 2D transfer functions. Now in the context of st statistical rendering we get two random variables x and y representing uncertainty in intensity and gradient, mag gradient magnitudes and then we study their joint distribution which is re represented by the pink circle in the transfer function space and to compute the expected viewing ray sample color. Here I will show a few results. Uh, uh, first I will uh, we, we show the result on a synthetic ex uh, results of the synthetic experiment on the tangle function which is visualized in the top left image. We add the ground truth uh, we mix the ground truth with the noise samples from a bimodal distribution and visualize the uh, the uncertain data using various statistics with non-parametric statistics in the bottom row and mean and parametric statistics in the top row. As we can see, we get improved classification and reconstruction in the case of non-parametric statistics. We consider four Gaussians for Gaussian mixture because they consume memory comparable to the quantile interpolation with eight quantiles. We also show the quantitative comparisons uh, by computing the difference images for visualizations obtained using various noise models with respect to the ground truth and also computing the root mean squared error with respect to the ground truth. As we can see again the non-parametric statistics gives us the least uh, relatively low RMSE compared to the mean or parametric statistics. Also uh, note that Gaussian mixtures require the Monte Carlo sampling in order to produce images whereas our Quantile interpolation approach, uh, uh, we, we, we produce images at interactive frame rates. Now, as we increase the number of quantiles for, from 4 to 8, we observe that the RMSE actually increased. So, we studied this behavior and found out that the, the reliability of quantile interpolation it depends on the size, the sample size, or the number of ensemble members. In the case when we, when we have a relatively low number of ensemble members, the quantile interpolation results can be uh, quite unstable. However, as we get sufficient sampling density, they become more stable. For more information on how to uh, ensure the sufficient sampling density, please refer to our paper. We also propose a box plot like view known as uh, which we call a quartile view to understand the uncertainty in data sets. 
<clears throat> as can be seen we see the variation in reconstruction across three quantile three uh, quantile populations which represent the uncertain portions of the data set we again visualize a similar set of results for the teardrop function and uh, we obtain of improved reconstruction using our quantile interpolation approach. We apply our techniques on the rate C AD simulation dataset provided by the SkiWiz Contest 2020 and um, to understand the AD positions in the dataset. Understanding AD positions is important in oceanology to understand the, uh, the transport of energy and water particles. Here we visualize uh, the eddies via by mapping rate to high velocity magnitude and blue to moderate whereas uh, and yellow to low low ma velocity magnitudes as we can see the presence of eddy e3 is observed across all noise models except for the mean field whereas e2 is only observed in uniform and gaussian whereas there is high uncertainty regarding the presence or position of eddy e1 Similarly, in the quartile view, we see AD E3 in all three quantile populations, whereas there is a high uncertainty of position reg uh, regarding the position of or presence of AD E1. We analyze the uncertainty due to downsampling also uh, using our uh, statistical frameworks, and uh, the leftmost image shows the high resolution image which we consider as the ground truth, which we downscale by the factor of 8 and visualize using statistical models. Again, we get the least RMAC and the improved reconstruction using our quantile interpolation approach compared to other statistical models. We also uh, see similar reconstruction improvements in the 2D transfer function case using uh, for the tooth uh, classic tooth data set. To conclude, we propose closed form non parametric framework for efficient statistical rendering by making use of quantile interpolation uh, in the reconstruction stage. We also can show qualitative and compar quantitative comparisons with other statistical models and present extension of volume rendering framework to 2D transfer functions. In the future, we will like to explore other options such as uneven, uneven quantile values, multidimensional transfer functions and de dependent random field assumption to improve, further improve the reconstruction or classification accuracy of direct volume rendering framework. Thank you. Alright, thank you very much for this nice work that you presented here. Um, to the audience, please post questions either on uh, Zoom, uh, on, on Discord or on YouTube. So far, I don't see any question yet. So um, let me start with a question uh, myself. Um, I, I have a question about the, the rendering that you do in, do in the end, right? So that's, I think, is still a bit of, a, of, an, of, a, of an issue, right? So you are creating these, uh, these, these quantiles and then um, you propose to render them um, basically uh, by looking at them one by one. Is there a way you, where you can better combine them I think you're still muted. I'm mute here. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, we have proposed this quartile view uh, in which we visualize these quantiles separately, correct? But mm -hmm. uh, uh, like we visualize these three quantiles separately. But but there was uh, but most of our visualizations, the expected visualizations for those. At viewing ray samples, we reconstructed uh, the density using the interpolation of those quantiles. So, so at, at viewing ray samples, we get a single probability distribution mm -hmm. and uh, which we integrate against the transfer function to get uh, idea of expected color. So, so it's only the quartile view in which we get uh, the separate visualizations. Mm -hmm. 
yeah um, and it, but in the other in the other views that you showed it it always looked to me as if the rendering part like the, the render part increase right so it looks as if you get like the mean plus some uncertainty mm -hmm. the the minus uncertainty part is a bit hard to to interpret and to, to grasp it okay uh, so you you are thinking that uh, there is a thickening thickening of the surfaces uh, is that what uh, you're asking sorry i i'm just not sure about the question so yeah that's what it, it seems to be that i mean if you if you're integrating over that uh, the things seem to expand uh, so so essentially we are computing the expected visualization uh, and the uncertainty portion we are only rendering through the quartile view but the expected visualization we evaluate it usually by comparing with the ground truth and by comparing for example computing the root mean squared error or the difference images so uh, i think uh, that's the only way that's that's how we evaluated our visualizations uh, it's hard to tell like visu visually uh, like the thickening or thinning of the surfaces mm. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's see, there are still no questions on our channels, our Discord mm -hmm. channel. So uh, then I think I would like to thank you again for this you. first presentation, but you will actually stay with us. Yeah, okay. So first, thank you for your first talk. Thanks. Now, the second talk is also given by, by Tusha Atherwell, and it's on uncertainty visualization of 2D Morse complex ensembles using statistical summary maps. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Dan Maljovic, Lin Yan, Chris Johnson, Valerio Pascucci, and Bei Wang. So again, the next talk, please. Hello everyone, I am Tushar Atole and in this talk I will present our work on uncertainty visualization of 2D MOS complex ensembles using statistical summary maps. Here is the outline of my presentation. Initially, I will describe the research question of topological based visualizations in the context of uncertain data, specifically for topological descriptors known as MOS complexes. I will also state a few related important research work. Then I will describe our proposed statistical summary maps for uncertainty visualization of mass complexes derived from ensemble datasets. And finally, I will present a few results showing the effectiveness of our statistical summary maps. Now, mass complexes have proved very effective in scientific applications in understanding complex datasets such as turbulent mixing layers and molecular surfaces. The mass complexes decompose the domain of scalar field into the cells of uniform gradient behavior such that uh, the gradient flows within, the, within a single cell flow to the same local maximum. However, uh, the noise in the data set can significantly distort the most complex topology. As shown in the given example, mixing the noise to the synthetic Ackley function results in the most complex topology significantly different from the ground truth most complex. Hence, we study the question of uh, extracting or, or understanding uncertainty visualization for mass complex ensembles. Now, several recent studies analyzed the topological uncertainty visualizations for topological descriptors such as critical points and gradient flows for scalar field and multi-field data. Several studies also uh, analyzed the effects of uncertainty on contour tree visualizations. Recently, Thompson et al. proposed positional likelihood visualizations of mass complexes for large-scale datasets. In this work, we study the uncertainty visualization of mass complexes by, by analyzing variability of gradient flows and critical points uh, using uh, the proposed statistical summary maps. Now, persistence and topological simplification are two important concepts relevant to our proposed statistical summary maps. The persistence is a tool to quantify the significance of topological features. For example, the maximum saddle pair DC shown in the given example has persistence P1. Also, pairs with uh, small persistence are usually the indicators of noisy features. Now, topological simplification is 
a tool for denoising a scalar field where the persistence uh, where the features with small persistences are are cancelled now here we uh, the topological simplification in this example results in cancellation of the maximum saddle pair xz which results in merge, merging of orange cell into the green cell and also diverting of gradients in the orange cell towards the local maximum uh, y now we explain our probabilistic map we begin with the input mass complex ensemble then we uh, extract or, or plot the persistence graphs persistence graph essentially plot maximum count as a function of persistence simplification level the elbow point in the persistence graph usually indicates separation of noise from the features hence we choose persistence simplification level 0.3 and study the ensemble for the same simplification level the right hand side image shows the spaghetti plots for the simplification level 0.3 and we can see significant geometric variability but still we observe the topological consistency among mass complexes now having in the simplified ensemble members we perform or derive the association among the local maxima of ensemble members using labeling strategies uh, uh, proposed in the previous work such as mandatory maxima kevin's clustering and mass mapping thus each local maxima gets label in the range 1 to 9 now having derived the labels we compute per pixel gradient destination probability which we also call as the probabilistic map the 100% agreement or certainty regions show positions in the space where the gradient destinations agree for all ensemble members whereas in uncertainty regions gradient destinations can vary across the ensemble members we visualize uncertainty regions using the color blending in which the color represents the color of a label and the weight represents the probability of gradient flow terminating into that label. We also extract the expected mass complex boundaries by visualizing positions which have 0.5 probability of flowing into any single label. We ex further explore uncertain regions of probabilistic maps through interactive probability density queries. For example, the gradient flows originating at selections 1 and 3 have highest probability of flowing into local maxima with the orange label. We also perform entropy-based uncertainty explorations, uh, where high entropy regions indicate high un uh, relatively higher unpredictability regarding the gradient destinations. Now, in the significance map, the first step is again uh, identical to the probabilistic map where we guide our persistence simplification level based by inspecting persistence graphs. In the second step, we assign each cell of the persistence simplified ensemble member the, the persistence of local maximum associated with the cell. Now, uh, for the pixels in, enclosed in the magenta boxes, the gradient flows can flow to either can, can either terminate into the feature with high persistence or low persistence. Hence, we visualize significance map using pointwise mean in which the fuzzy regions indicate the positions of uh, uncertainty in gradient flow directions. Uh, we also visualize uh, the interactive queries uh, where at selection 0, we can see that the gradient flows have high probability of terminating into the persistence with high significance. We visualize significance maps uh, using uh, variance and entropy uh, of pointwise variance and pointwise entropy which highlight the positions with significant variations in the significance values uh, 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 and also indicate the potential positions of mass complex boundaries. The patchwise entropy further highlights the uncertain regions. Now in the survival map the core step is computing the local gradient survival. In this example since the orange region has the orange cell has lower persistence than the green cell we cancel the orange cell thus the gradients in the green cell survive and they get rewarded by the uh, by the persistence value of the cancelled maximum look maximum saddle pair which is xz thus uh, in the survival map computation we first compute uh, the the persistences of feature in increasing order for a single member and then we apply topological simplification and compute the local survival as explained in the previous slide uh, to 
get gain insight into the aggregate local survival across the entire domain we again visualize the uh, si the survival map using the similar techniques as the significance map now first we show the results for the wind data set comprising of 15 ensemble members as we can see the first initially we guide the persistent simplification through the, by inspecting persistence graphs and the spaghetti plots here we show the comparison of probabilistic map and a mean field the expected con mass complexes derived using the probabilistic map look very much similar to the mean field mass complex however, however they also give additional insight into the positional uncertainty of the expected mass complex here we also visualize the significance map for the wind data set where the patch wise entropy highlights the position with significant randomness uh, in the mass complex position which is also seen in the spaghetti plots the aggregate aggregate segmentation proposed by thompson et al highlights the positions of like li likely positions of of the mass complexes whereas our visualizations show the uh, or highlight the positions with higher variations in the mass complexes here we compare significance and survival maps the significance map performs analysis for fixed simplification scale whereas survival map performs uh, analysis for all simplification scales the high persistence feature seen at the top of the domain is preserved in both the maps whereas the low persistence feature in the significance map appears as high high significance feature in the in the survival map hence a further investigation need, is needed to resolve the uncertainty we analyze the time dependent flow data set where the in the scalar field the the flow moves from down to down to upside and also the because of the obstacle near the blue region it it results in vortex shading which is observed in the mass complexes however mean field loses significant topological information regarding the vertical features now since this data set exhibits a relatively high uh, noise levels uh, even at even after persistent simplification the, we we opt for mass mapping and k means labeling strategies because the mandatory maxima again loses significant topological information the the probabilistic map nicely recovers the topological features uh, as opposed to the mean field uh, uh, as we had observed in the individual members and also gives indication of positional uncertainty of the recovered topological features we visualize significance and survival maps for the uh, uh, for the time dependent flow and the point wise variance highlights the positions uh, on the border of the chaotic regions in the uh, in the spaghetti plot also the point wise mean in the survival map uh, highlights the position uh, highlights the significant feature shared across all ensemble members we analyze the rare c ad simulation data set made available on the skewis contest 2020 website the single member in the single member the dotted boxes highlight the positions of vertical features now our probabilistic map nicely summarizes the topology of ensembles and indicates the presence of four vertical features uh, we also perform the agreement exploration where uh, 80% indicate image indicates uh, that 80% of members agree in that they have uh, they they indicate the presence of three vertic vertical features thus to conclude we present statistical summary maps for uncertainty visualization of mass complexes we we use various labeling strategies for deriving the labeling uh, for deriving probabilistic maps we show improved topological recovery using our proposed maps in comparison to the mean field visualizations and also uh, also show that uh, also present demonstrate the effectiveness of various techniques such as color blending and interactive probability density queries for visualizing uncertain quantified uncertainties using the set our proposed statistical summary maps thank you
Thank you very much also for this second nice presentation that we had here. And again, uh, the floor is open for questions. So please, anybody who has a question, post it on Discord or YouTube. Um, I, I have a small question on the computation commands. So how, how computation involves is, is that actually the whole thing that you're presenting? Uh, the computational requirement? Yeah. Uh, uh, it's basic, it, it's, it's uh, so essentially, let me think, because uh, it's not that computationally expensive because we are doing, working on the 2D domain. Uh, it's not yet, we have not gone yet to 3D domain because uncertainty rendering in 3D is uh, still challenged. But in 2D domain, uh, essentially, at we are doing computation for pixel. So uh, I believe that uh, what are the, comp the complexity of mass complex uh, computation? And that's pretty much it into number of ensemble members. OK, we have a question here from Maria Zemankova. And uh, I guess you have to answer the question theoretically, because we just said that you're not doing it in 3D yet. But the question is, are there any 3D uncertain topologies you cannot present, like uh, spheres or knots or something? Uh, let me. I'm so. Let, I'm not sure if I understood the question right. Are there uh, are there any 3D uncertain topologies uh, that you cannot present? Mm, okay. So uh, I'm not sure what that question means. Uh, do, uh, can you explain a little bit? Uh, maybe I give that back to Maria. <laughs> maybe I'll elaborate on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, our work is restricted to three domains right now because even if we could quantify uncertainty in 3D, uh, it's uh, we have to come up with new visual mappings to render uncertainty in 3D. Uh, but uh, I, I don't have any comments right now for any 3D uncertainty visualizations for this uh, for this topological um, uh, contribution. All right, good. Then thank you again a second time. A round of applause or hand washing in YouTube uh, for for <laughs> for Tushar. <laughs> thank you. And move on to our third talk, um, who will be given by Ming Dong Zhang from the Tsinghua University in Beijing. And it's on uncertainty oriented ensemble data visualization and exploration using variable spatial spreading. And this is a joint work with uh, Li Cheng, Zhang Li, Zhao Yuan, and Junhai Yong. So, please. Everyone, welcome to my talk, Uncertainty-Oriented Ensemble Data Realization and Exploration Using Variable Spatial Spreading. I'm Ming Dong from Tsinghua University, and this work is cooperated with WeBank and Perkins University. As an important method of handling potential uncertainties in numerical simulation, <laughs> ensemble simulation has been widely applied in many disciplines. Realization is a promising and powerful way of presenting and analyzing ensemble simulation data. Although conventional realization methods demonstrate promising performance in real-world ensemble data analysis, several challenges still exist. Challenge 1. Lack of balance between location-based and feature-based analysis. Existing ensemble realization works are classified into two categories, namely location-based and feature-based methods. The individual selection and separate analysis of any one of the two dimensions would fail to capture critical elements in the ensemble data and inevitably cause a considerable loss of information. Challenge 2. Insufficient analysis on the temporal dimension how to represent the time-wearing ensemble simulation data effectively and efficiently and uncover underlying patterns and uh, interesting region remains a great concern for ensemble simulation data analysis. Challenge 3. Repeated trial and error process. Thus, a repeated and uh, insufficient trial and error process is required and uh, 
may easily lead to insufficient loss of information. Challenge 4. Inefficient intervention. With a high complexity and multivariance of ensemble data, most existing visualization methods focus on simplifying data to reveal the main structure or adding beliefs to represent uncertainty. However, different sampling or simplification approaches tend to emphasize certain parts of information while ignoring others. This calls for a more flexible intervention to provide different views. To resolve these issues, and in consideration of the influence of spatial location, we propose a novel feature-based ensemble data analysis method to achieve a balance between location and feature-based analysis. In contrast to previous studies, which leverage spatial locations as a primary analysis dimension and perform a global analysis based on the local analysis of each grid point, our approach consists considers the attribute variables as a primary analysis dimension. Conventionally, the uncertainty is calculated at each grid point according to the ensemble members and then analyzed and realized separately. In our work, we first divide the variable space and then describe its spatial distribution in each corresponding interval to characterize the corresponding uncertainty. This process helps construct an overview of the global uncertainty distribution and assist in the subsequent interactive exploration in the feature space. To meet this design, we must first define a method to measure the uncertainty distribution. We use variable spreading to achieve this. Considering the distribution of the uncertainty brain by the gradient, we should decouple them. Here, we define gradient as the change rate of attributes in the spatial dimension and the spreading as a spatial region that is the attributes value cover. Remember represented by the red curve is the green one moved along the x-axis. According to the definition, for any two points on the y-axis, the corresponding division of the x-coordinate of the two members are constant as shown in segment A and C. However, for any different points on the x-axis, the corresponding division of the y-coordinate varies, such as the two pink segments B and D. This observation can be also reflected by the curve of the, of the standard deviation. However, in this case, we can maintain that the uncertainty is uniformly distributed and uh, thus inconsistent with the color mapping of the standard deviation. In the second figure, we replace member 2 with member 3, the purple curve, which is the first member transferred in the x-axis with scaled distance, getting the maximum value when x is 0.5. Thus, when the ensemble contains member 1 and member 3, the maximum of uncertainty located at the point 0 0.5, 0 0.36. Both the spreading and the standard deviation can reflect this phenomenon. However, if we put them together, the gradient change brought about by adding mass member 2 masks the uncertainty that can be previously reflected by the standard deviation. Our proposed variable spreading can be regarded as the X range covered by different ensemble members of one point in the Y axis which is the axis of the variable value. After calculating the spreading of each x value, a spreading curve is established along the range of the variable. These curves can represent the uncertainty distribution of the variable. We can observe that the curve is not smooth but has several peaks and valleys. These extreme points indicate some potential important characteristics. The two kinds of extreme points maximum and minimum points have different physical meanings. Based on the proposed feature spreading technique, we build an interactive realization framework, which consists of a parameter setting panel, a region stability heat map, a 2D map view, 
a temporal analysis view, a spreading curve view, and a display control toolbar. Letter analysis is severely affected by the region selection, which depends on the domain knowledge and the experience of the analyst. However, even the most experienced analyst cannot guarantee the right choice of region. Furthermore, region choices differ in various circumstances and uh, analytical tasks. Therefore, showing the stability of the region is critical. The objective of our analysis is uncertainty. Thus, we define the stability of a region as the stability of its uncertainty, which is measured by comparing with the region after translation and expansion. To compare spreading curves, we overlay and display the spatial spreading curves of the regions, which are the selected region biased in both directions to show the stability of the selected region. The green, red, orange, and purple curve are the spatial spreading curves in the regions corresponding to the selected region biased in left, up, right, and down directions by one grid, respectively. In the 2D map view, the bottom of the uncertain region is selected. In its corresponding biased curve view, the red curve has a higher peak, while the purple curve has a lower one, indicating that more complete and certain regions would be covered by moving region upward. If the bottom right column of the region is selected, the curves moving left and upward have higher peaks. Considering using only one mesh of offset could be accidental, we calculate the spreading curves for four directions with one to five offsets. However, 100 spreading curves are generated, which would cause severe viral clutter if displayed simultaneously. After a careful observation and analysis of these curves, we decide to use the maximum to represent the curve. We can use color mapping to show it. Red means positive and green means negative, and the saturation of the color maps to the absolute scale from 0 to 1. The figure shows that the heat map is continuous and uh, consistent with the previous conclusion, thereby providing more comparative migration results, while the biased curve shows more detailed migration details. The two views jointly provide the analyst with region stability and guidance for region selection. After finishing the analysis at one static time step, the experts continued to investigate the continuity of their findings in the temporal dimension. They first checked the temporal view and observed that the division of each time step tends to become increasingly simpler over time to general. This finding is consistent with the fact that Prolonged time corresponds to an increased forecast uncertainty and thus fuzzier features. The expert identified a disconnection of the red line at 138 hours. At the same time step, the purple line appears close to the red line. The expert wondered whether this phenomenon is caused by mismatching. Thus, they bruised the spaghetti plots of the corresponding time steps in the map view. These spaghetti plots are shown from A to D, where the complexity of the red lines is disappearing. Thus, the expert concluded that meteorological changes occurred. In this study, we design an interactive realization framework to help ensemble simulation domain experts explore ensemble data in terms of spatial and variable dimensions. In particular, we propose a measurement method for feature space distribution and design a calculation method based on sampling. This method achieves a balance between computational accuracy and efficiency by controlling the sampling number. Based on the results, we provide different realization designs 
to show the feature spreading curve, region stability, and temporal trends. In the future, we plan to extend our calculation method and realization framework to analyze more than one variable. We also plan to use it for general application scenario. Thank you very much, Ming Dong, for another nice, very interesting talk. Again, please post your questions in the chat. So I will start again uh, with, uh, with the first question. Um, when looking at your at your region stability analysis, you kind of were brushing in the spaghetti plot, and then you had coordinated views where you could locally analyze the brushed region. Um, did you also think about having a global view of, of your stability analysis? Is that somehow possible? Did you spend any ideas along those lines? Uh, our region stability view uh, just uh, shows the local uh, stability. Uh, if we uh, for the selected reg uh, region, uh, we show the uncertainty change uh, in the selection for the, uh, the bias for the four direction, and uh, uh, it's it just the focus on the uh, selected region, not the global region. Yeah, yes, the, I understood that. That that's uh, that was was great. Uh, I was wondering whether there's a way to to also give a global overview that points you towards where should you do your local analysis. Uh, uh, to choose the uh, region to uh, further analysis, uh, uh, the region stability view cannot. Uh, is not supposed to uh, assist this, uh, and uh, uh, we should uh, uh, to state the two D map view and uh, uh, select a uh, uh, region uh, according to the domain expert uh, according to the domain knowledge, and uh, further refine the region uh, according to the region stability view. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Good. There are no further questions, then thank you, Ming Dong, for this nice talk and congratulations again. We move on to our fourth talk. And now it's going to be about uncertainty in continuous scatter plots, continuous parallel coordinates, and fibers. The presentation is given by Bo Yang Zheng from the University of Heidelberg. And this is joint work with Philip Sadlo. So My name is Bo Yan Zheng from the Visual Computing Group at Heidelberg talk. University. This work has been done together with my colleague, Philip Sadlo. The most common techniques to visualize multivariate data are scatter plots and parallel coordinates, consisting of points and lines. While these approaches are designed for discrete data, they can also be applied to discrete samples of continuous data. Here we see a regular sampling of a continuous domain using 100 samples, 900 samples, 10,000 samples, 90,000 samples. We can see, however, that discrete scatter plots and discrete parallel coordinates tend to suffer from occlusion and clutter. Also, the sampling of the continuous domain can lead to erroneous structure, as in the case of such curves. This motivated Weisskopf and colleagues to introduce continuous scatter plots and continuous parallel coordinates, which present the density of such plots and are obtained directly from the continuous data. In this work, we extend these continuous concepts to uncertain data, in which the data do not map to a certain value, but to a distribution. Let us first have a look at the previous works. The goal of continuous scatter plots is to determine the density kappa in the data domain psi, where the data is mapped to. In the spatial domain omega, Bechtaler and Weisskopf assume constant density. A mass is conserved in the mapping from the spatial domain to the data domain. In terms of triangles, 
a triangle D in the spatial domain maps to a triangle delta in the data domain with the same mass. From this, Bechtala and Weisskopf derive the following equations relating density kappa to the determinant or the volume of the resulting element in the data domain. If m is smaller than n, they integrate over so-called fibers, which we will discuss later. Although very powerful, this approach is only applicable to simplicial input grades, and it does not support uncertainty. Our work addresses these two extensions. Based on the continuous scatter plots, Hanrich and Weisskopf presented continuous parallel coordinates. Here, the parallel coordinates are split into so-called 2D independent parallel coordinates domains, IPCDs, which represent consecutive pairs of axes of the parallel coordinate system. Similar to the continuous scatter plots, they also based this approach on mice conservation, but this time not with respect to mapping between two triangles, but mapping between a line and a point, according to the point-line duity between Cartesian coordinates and parallel coordinates. In the resulting formulation, one needs to integrate in the IPCD over an interval of eta2, which is one of axis of the IPCD. Also here, the approach is limited to simplicial grades and does not support uncertainty. Finally, the third concept that we will extend are so-called fibers, which are the pre-images of a value in multivariate data. Here on the left-hand side, we see fibers for 2D bivariate data. If one selects a value in the data domain psi, the resulting fibers consist of the points in the spatial domain that exhibit this bivariate value. In 3D bivariate data, fibers represent curves in the spatial domain. This concept does also not yet support uncertainty. To summarize, the contribution of our work is the extension of these three concepts to uncertain data. But before discussing these extensions, let us first have a closer look at uncertain data and their representation. Whereas certain data map to a single value, uncertain data map to a distribution. Here we can see a certain and an uncertain 2D scalar field. To derive our mathematical models, we make use of the representation of uncertain continuous data by auto ETL and apply it to n-dimensional m varied uncertain data. In their representation, the dimensions of the data domain are added to the spatial domain, here xi, and the scalar field defined on this extended domain represents the probability of the uncertain data to attain the respective value. In our implementation, we focus on 2D and 3D uncertain bivariate fields, which leads to 4D and 5D scalar field representations. This is the building block which we will use to extend the previous concepts to uncertainty. Now let us recap the traditional plots we have already seen. Let us now incorporate our uncertain data model into these plots, which provides the formulations for uncertain continuous scatter plots and uncertain continuous parallel coordinates. As we will see later, it is straightforward to derive the concept of uncertain fibers from this model of uncertain continuous scatter plots. Since parallel coordinates are split into 2D independent domains in their continuous concept, it is sufficient to consider bivariate distributions for both uncertain continuous scatter plots and uncertain continuous parallel coordinates. In our implementation, we assume bivariate Gaussian distribution as input and interpolate the respective mu and sigma from node-based representation in the spatial domain. Now let us come to the uncertain continuous scatter plots. The model that we derive requires integration of this distribution in the spatial domain omega. We present two approaches to do so, one that is sampling based and one that is convolution based. The former is rather straightforward and employs Monte Carlo integration. 
The latter first obtains the traditional continuous scatter plot without uncertainty, followed by convolution to incorporate the effect of the uncertainty. To obtain the value kappa of a pixel of the UCSP using Monte Carlo integration, we first employ regular subdivision of every cell in the spatial domain. We then choose a random position within each of these subcells and interpolate the uncertainty there. We determine the probability that the interpolated value lies in the range of this pixel and accumulate these probabilities of the pixel epsilon. The disadvantages of this approach include that it requires a rather high sampling density and that it is rather slow in case of irregular gray cells. On the other hand, its advantages include that it supports non simplicial input grades and that the result is accurate, which is the reason why we used it as a ground truth for the convolution-based approach. In the convolution-based approach, we first obtain the traditional CSP without uncertainty within the region tau C, which is the region of cell C in the data domain. We achieve this using the original approach by Bartala and Weisskopf. We then convolve every Z1 and Z2 in this certain CSP with K. A Gaussian kernel obtained by interpolating the corresponding uncertainty with respect to Z1 and Z2 in region tau C. Finally, to obtain the uncertain continuous scatter plot, we need to accumulate all these convolved results. The advantage of this approach is its fast computation, since no massive sampling is needed. On the other hand, it requires simplicial input grades because it is based on Bartalo and Weisskopf's approach. In order to indicate the uncertainty in the UCSP and to support the interpretation of the impact of uncertainty, we superimpose a white outline of the traditional CSP without uncertainty. As shown on the right, this is inspired by gradient plots. Now let us investigate uncertain continuous parallel coordinates. As already introduced, we first split the parallel coordinate system into 2D IPCDs. Pixels in the corresponding UCSP map to trapezoids in this IPCD. Thus, the density phi of the uncertain parallel coordinates plot is computed by superposition of these trapezoids in a small interval along eta2. Notice that this enables to compute the UCPC directly from an UCSP. Let us now look at our third extension, the uncertain fibers. The sampling-based approach for uncertain continuous scatter plot computation can be easily adapted for computing uncertain fibers, which represent a probability distribution in the spatial domain. The only difference in the approach is that instead of computing the density of all pixels, one needs to compute the density only for pixel epsilon that contains the given value xi, and that one needs to store the respective probabilities to each subcell in the spatial domain. Finally, one can increase the range in the data domain to a region delta to obtain uncertain range fibers. One can see here how increasing the range provides larger uncertain range fibers. Let us now have a look at some results. We start with a simple synthetic 2D bivariate chord example. The certain and uncertain continuous scatter plots and continuous parallel coordinate plots are shown on the right. We observe that the uncertainty reflects in blur. Let us now decompose the chord into triangles. It is apparent, in particular with the uncertain scatter plots, that such decomposition has strong impact on the resulting data. Here we have a 3D bivariate counterpart. And again we see a strong impact of the decomposition into tetrahedra. Again the impact of uncertainty reflects in blurring. Let us now have a look at a more complex dataset. The ERA5 hourly dataset represents a weather forecast with uncertainty estimated from ensembles. Let us investigate this data by certain and uncertain continuous scatter plots. We can directly observe that 
The uncertainty in this data leads to a substantial density in regions with negative specific humidity, which is unrealistic and could help improving the simulation model. Also, it is apparent that uncertainty of humidity is strongly dependent on temperature. Notice that the white uncertainty indicator helps in evaluating respective error ranges in different regions. Here we see the uncertain fibers in this data set. We select two different values in the UCSP and compare the certain and uncertain fibers. Here we can see that, in contrast to certain fibers, uncertain fibers can exhibit gaps due to high uncertainty. To demonstrate the utility of range fibers for investigating the reasons for structures in uncertain continuous scatter plots, we select the red and green region in unrealistic negative humidity ranges, and the blue region with maximum humidity. One can see that the red and green fibers that lead to negative humidity are widely distributed, whereas the blue fibers that leads to maximum humidity is rather compact. Of course, further interpretation with respect to the underlying simulation model is beyond of this work, but could represent future work in meteorology. The contribution of this paper is summarized as following. Extension of continuous scatter plots to uncertain data, two algorithms Thanks. for its accelerated computation where of one without restrictions on the type of input grade, extension of continuous parallel coordinates to uncertain data, and extension of fibers to uncertain data. Future work is the extension to cases with m larger than 2 and to different probability distributions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Boyan, for this nice talk. Um, thank you. And we also have a question for you. So Tom okay. Postnevire asks, mm -hmm. have you considered other channels to encode the uncertainty separately? Color is essentially being used to encode high frequency and high uncertainty. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. Um, uh, we didn't consider other channels to to represent uncertainty since um, we have uh, saw a paper suggested by the reviewers that uh, the gradient plots can represent the uncertainty better than other like arrow bars. So that's why we use color and this blur effect to to represent uncertainty. I think for for to represent uncertainty, this is the like generalized um, choice. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Yeah, Tom says really nice work and really nice talk. Um, Thanks. But, uh, I, I've made a similar question uh, going along mm -hmm. the same lines. I mean, if I look at, at your uncertain uh, scatter plots that you have there, then you basically have an extension to the outside, but within the, the, the white area, the, mm -hmm. the white line inside it basically looks the same as before that means mm -hmm. i only have like a one-sided uncertainty that i can actually, mm -hmm. uh, actually mm -hmm. uh, tell yeah um yeah good question i think this is the disadvantage of um, actually uh, the scatter plots because before the in the traditional scatter plot they suffer that could not represent the density and then let's uh, when the uncertainty is involved this still could be an issue but um, since we have also um, presented our um, solution on the uncertain fibers i think this could be uh, a great help for the domain expert to explore what happens inside of this um, region like uh, i mean for the region that could not reviewing the the uncertainty so well inside of this um, this range um, within the white outline. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was compelling use case. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right, then I'd like to thank you again for this talk. Thank you so much. And move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. The next one will be given by Ulam Jelani Quadri from the University of South Florida. And it's on the modeling 
of the modeling the influence of visual density on cluster perception in scatter plots using topology. And uh, this is joint work with Paul Rosen. So please. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. I'm Ghulam Jilani, a PhD student at University of South Florida under advisement of Dr. Paul Rosen. Scatter plots are often used to visualize structures and patterns in the data. They're also used for a variety of visual analytic tasks, including cluster identification. Clustering occurs when patterns in the data form distinct group. However, clustering is an ill-posed problem as the current clustering depends upon multiple factors. For example, it is ambiguous where circle region is one cluster or two. When considering clustering in a scatter plot, several factors play a role in how they are perceived. The features of the data as well as visual encoding we chose influences how many clusters we see. Let's see some examples where perception is ambiguous in the given design. For example, how many clusters can we really see with varying distribution size or the number of data points? Data aspects such as data distribution size, type or the number of data points can influence the visual presentation by varying the plotting density. On the other hand, visual encoding properties such as mark size, mark opacity similarly have potential to influence perceptual judgments. The conventional approach to optimizing scatter plot design is through trial and error of different combination. In our study, we proposed mathematical models to optimize the scatter plot design for cluster perception. We developed models that consider how visual density influences the cluster perception in a scatter plot using a data structure from topological data analysis called the merge tree. With these models, we use threshold plots to optimize the saliency of clusters based on data features and visual encoding. In this example, we vary the opacity of data points. The threshold plot shows that three clusters are more clearly visible in the pink with 5% opacity and green 10% opacity scatter plots. Three clusters are significantly less visible in the blue 1% opacity scatter plot. Finally, the clusters are not visible at all in the purple 50% opacity or orange 100% opacity scatter plots. First, we provide some context to the factors we have considered in our study. Sermai et al.'s taxonomy of visual cluster separation in scatter plots used a qualitative evaluation to identify important factors. Sadahiro developed a mathematical model and suggested the concentration and change in density significantly influence perception. Matejka et al. defined opacity scaling model for reducing or plotting in scatter plots. We focused on how spatial factors, for example, proximity, concentration, change in density, and opacity influence cluster perception. In particular, we consider how design aspects influencing the visual density affects cluster perception in a scatter plot. We selected these four factors to study data features, including distribution size and the number of data points and visual encoding, including size of data points and opacity of data points. We built two models that consider these factors to varying degrees. The first model, distance-based model, tries to capture human perception of clusters by considering the spatial resolution 
at which two or more cluster distribution will blend to be perceived as one. As we can see in the figure at D2, purple and orange distribution touch and blend into one cluster. Similarly, at D3, orange and yellow cluster blend into one. As I mentioned earlier, we use the merge tree to capture this structure and it requires knowledge of cluster center as the input. However, knowing the cluster centers is not always feasible in the real data. Hence, we consider a second density-based model where the input is scatterplot itself. The density-based model attempts to directly identify the relative visual density at which users will differentiate between clusters. To do this, a 2D histogram of the visual density is created for the scatter plot and the density is analyzed. 2D histogram is created of grid cells with uniform width and height. For example, as we can see, F2 and F3, the regions represented by orange and purple merge together, indicating the relative visual density separating them. To visualize the clustering structure generated by models, we use a threshold plot, which plots visual saliency against the number of clusters visible. Using this plot, we can see, for example, with the green 10% opacity, a user is most likely to see two or six clusters. And the overall clustering structure is more distinctive than with 1% opacity in the blue or 100% default opacity in orange. We ran a three-stage user study to assess the ability of our models to predict the number of clusters an average user would perceive. In the experiment, we showed users scatter plots of synthetically generated data and asked them how many clusters they saw. The models demonstrated significant effect size for many of the factors tested. For more details, please read our paper. We will now take a look at the prediction accuracy. Here, we compare using no models to the distance-based and density-based models. These plots show estimation ac accuracy error horizontally against the frequency of the occurrence. For these plots, closer to zero indicates a good prediction. Without a model, the results skew negatively due to the overlap and blending of clusters. The distance-based model significantly improves the results over a without model. Finally, the highest estimation accuracy was achieved using density-based model with an average error of 0.2 and a standard deviation of 1.6. Effectively perceiving patterns in the scatter plot is a perennial topic in visualization. The models we have introduced construct a bridge for visualization designer between their choice of visual encoding and how users perceive clusters. Distribution size and cluster is in the nature of data and visualization designer generally do not have control over this factor. Visualization designer have limited control on the number of points, mostly in terms of data subsampling. The density based model can now be used to evaluate what level of sampling provides the optimal saliency of clusters in the given scatter plots. The point size is the first design factor with complete control in the scatter plots. Increasing or decreasing the area of pixels also increases or decreases the total visual density. Once again, the density-based model can be used to help select the point size 
that provide the optimal saliency of the visualization. Opacity is another factor for which designer has complete control from fully transparent to fully opaque, once again impacting the visual density of the scatter plots. As suggested by prior studies, when selecting opacity, there is a trade-off with picking a point size and from our analysis also with the number of data points shown in the visualization. I will now show a demonstration of how our models can be used to optimize the visualization of data sets. These two examples vary the number of data points and then the opacity of data points. If you'd like to try in yourself, please visit the demo website to the right of the screen. In the first example, we show how to use density-based model to optimize the saliency when varying the number of data points. The threshold plots provides quick and easy access to optimizing the saliency of clusters shown. With the adjustment of number of points using the model, we can see that at given n value, users can see seven clusters. The interactive model can be used to select the optimal value of the visual encoding, here the number of points. Here we look at varying the opacity of data points, again using the density based model. The threshold plot allows for selecting an opacity value that best highlights three cluster in the visualization. With adjustment of opacity of points using the model, we can see that at a given opacity value, users can see three clusters. Again, the interactive model can be used to select optimal value of the visual encoding, here opacity of data points. In summary, scatter plots are commonly used visualization type and clustering is a commonly performed low-level task on them. Our study has demonstrated the importance of factors including distribution size, the number of data points, size of data points, and the opacity of data points in cluster perception on scatter plots. To model people perception of clusters, we built and validated two models, a distance and density-based model for the task. Finally, Visualization practitioner may apply these models as a guide mm -hmm. for optimizing the properties of their own visualization. I have left out many details. I encourage you to read our papers or contact me for more details. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Gulam. Nice work. So again, please post your questions. Okay, so let me start with a with the first question. Um, your study was based on distances between the points in the scatter plot. Um, you did not look into any kind of shape. I mean, there are all these gestalt principles. Uh, do you have an idea on how, on how you could incorporate those? You're still muted. Can you unmute? Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a really great question. Actually, uh, in our study, especially in distance-based model, we have considered only uh, centers of the clusters. But yeah, we have not specially consider the different shapes of the cluster or the you know, data sets uh, to, and to see how it um, uh, affects the user perception or cluster perception. But that's what we have considered as our uh, follow-up study and future study, which we're working currently on. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Good, are there any questions? Um, Anjana Arunkumar writes, I'd be interested to see some scaling-based experiments in line with uh, the work by Bay et al. Oh, you know, uh, are you familiar with the work? 
uh, I no, not sure, but uh, I will so answer the question. Scaling based experiments. Yeah, scaling based experiments mostly. Uh, we uh, will, uh, you know, uh, extend the uh, number of participants or also extend the number of uh, uh, different data sets. And also in the going to the overdraw and scatter plots, that's we have in mind. And then uh, currently we're focusing on those areas as a part of scaling based experiments. Mm -hmm. There's another question by Maria Zemankova. How does your visualization compare to computational cluster separation measures? Okay, so uh, that's a, one of the really you know, critical questions or uh, thing which we need to uh, understand. Uh, currently in our uh, study, uh, we are not seeing that in a correlation between the number of clusters and the accuracy. Actually, we are seeing that what in, uh, visual density factor actually affects the you know perception of the clusters but uh, obviously overlapping of the clusters will be seen as one whether it as a human perceive or as a you know uh, our model based upon the visual density uh, affects so that's part we are still focusing on that all right i think that partially also answered the, the last question which is about the overlapping of, of clusters um how have they been considered to affect the user perception yes uh, yes uh, actually uh, Overlapping the clusters do affects the cluster user perception because uh, that's why uh, we in our initial study, pilot study, we have seen that the lot more results are uh, skewed towards negative side because if there are two clusters and they really like even slightly or more overlap, they will be considered as one. So yeah, it does affect the user perception. All right, then thank you very much for this nice and interesting talk. Thank you.